Um, I'm excited that I get to be with you guys today, um, that I get to uh, continue to actually close out this series, Go, that we've been in these last several weeks. Um, for those of you who might not know me, uh, my name is AJ. I'm one of the pastors here at Awaken, um, and I get to be a part and oversee a lot of the outreach that Awaken um, is, is doing in the community. So the teams and the organizations that and ministries are going on around Clarksville, I get to partner with them and work with them, and I get to help facilitate some of the um, work that Awaken itself and those of us who, who just serve and are a part of Awaken, the things that we get to go out and do and help pour into the leaders who are, who are doing that. So it's really fitting that I get to kind of close out this series as we're talking about mobilizing the church. That's what this series of, called Go is about, mobilizing as a church. And I know that that term can kind of be sort of not, not fully clear for a lot of us. So I wanted to bring some definition before we even go forward. What, do, what it means to mobilize as the church, what this whole series has been about. Um, mobilizing is any kind of spiritual work happening outside the walls of a Sunday, okay? Spiritual work happening outside of a Sunday. It's outside of this building, typically. It's, it's somewhere out in the community. It's during the week. It's, it's spiritual work, though. It's ministry, that's what it means to mobilize. That's what we're seeking to do as a church this year. And that's what this series has been about. Um, Pastor Nate has been sharing some different messages, talking about different aspects of what that will look like for us to mobilize. And today, what I wanted to do as we close out this series is just answer a few questions, bring a little bit of clarity to what that means, how that's going to look in our life, how we can apply that to our lives. So um, as I was kind of preparing this message as I was thinking about what it means to mobilize, going out in the community, taking that leap out into our city. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about what, is, what are the feelings we're going to have? What are the, the things that we're going to experience as we go out? And I was wondering about that. And while I was thinking it over, it actually, a, a lot of that reminds me of my first experience I ever went cliff jumping. There's a lot of crossover. So I want to kind of connect that dots for you so you can kind of understand this. If you don't know what cliff jumping is, it's literally jumping off a cliff into a body of water. That's what you do. So the first time I ever did that, um, this was in Arizona, northern Arizona. Um, that's where I used to live is back in Arizona. And my family took a camping trip. We went up there. There's a big lake. It's real nice. Um, blue water, bunch of cliffs on the one end, and then forest all around it. And one day, that, while we're all camping, my family, some of my friends, we're all together. Someone brings up, hey, we, sh we should go over to that cliff. We should go, go cliff jumping. That'd be fun. And that's right up my alley. That's something I really enjoy. That, that's very fitting for the things that I'm interested in. And I thought, all right, yeah, we should definitely do that. So we go on a hike. All of us go as a group. We're getting closer. It takes a little while. But we arrive finally on the edge of this cliff. We're standing there together. And then I walk over to the edge. I look down. It's like 40, 45 feet or so. It's a little bit intimidating now. Like I'm starting to feel that intimidation factor. I wasn't really worried before, and I know that I'm still going to jump. I'm willing to push through that intimidation, but now I'm definitely having to take a step back real quick and just gather myself and be like, oh, what am I about to do here? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to think through it a little bit. That, that's very intimidating to have to make this leap. And we're talking to our friends, and everyone's saying, all right, well, I think we just got to go. We just got to make it happen. And I'm building up the courage. I'm getting ready to do it. And while I'm building up the courage for it, this guy climbs up over the edge of the cliff. He's soaking wet. Clearly, he had just jumped earlier. And he says, oh, man, the water is freezing cold. <laughs> that was the worst thing that I could have been told <laughs> for multiple reasons. But the main one, I hate being cold. It's like the worst thing in the world. I, I, it's just, I despise it. So the idea of jumping off this cliff and then having to hit freezing cold water, that's terrible. I'm having to set aside all my comfort. It's nice and warm breeze is blowing up there. I got a nice view, get to see the forest. I'm having a good time up there. I'm comfortable. But now I have to leave that comfort and step into a shock. And I'm rethinking everything at this point. Thinking, is this even what I want to do? Is this the right choice? What's, what, why, why am I really doing this? Start thinking through all of that. And then it hits me. You came here to jump. That's why you came. 
You didn't come here to look. You came here to jump. That's why you're on the edge of this cliff. And I started saying, okay, you got to go. Start telling myself, all right, go ahead, AJ. Take the plunge. You can do it. You got you to gotta make it happen. Talk to one of my friends. We both agree. We'll go together. We'll count it down. We do that. Three, two, one. We both run side by side. Jump. I'm looking at him as we're falling. And then we hit the water. And you know what? The guy did not lie. It was freezing cold. It was so cold. I'm immediately tensed up. I'm like shivering as I'm diving down slow into the water. Slow down eventually. I'm like gathering myself. Swim to the surface. By the time my head comes out of the water, my body is kind of acclimated. Like still a little bit uncomfortable, but by the time I swim to the shore, I don't feel bad at all anymore. From that point on, we had an amazing day. Climbed back up, and we jumped again and again and again and again, and it wasn't a problem anymore. And there's a lot of parallels to the feelings that I felt on the side of that cliff and what we're doing as a church in mobilizing. Because when we are mobilizing as a church, those feelings I felt, those are the same feelings that we're going to feel. There's going to be an intimidation factor. So some of us, for that, that's the biggest deal. That's the biggest thing to overcome. We're scared. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know how to approach it. We, we don't know how we're going to deal with it, if we can deal with it. So we're shrinking back. For other, others of us, it's not the intimidation that's mostly the problem. It's, it's the discomfort. It's going to cause us to have to step out of our comfort zone. It's going to challenge us with our time. It's going to challenge us with the things that we're accustomed to. And we have to look at those things and say, hey, why am I here? What am I a part of all of this for? Why am I in this building right now? What's the point of all of this? And the truth is, if we start to ask that question, I think we're going to start hearing Jesus whisper in our ear, take the plunge. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take the plunge. And that's going to be the title of today's message. Go ahead. Take the plunge. That's what he's asking us. Now, I wanted you guys to know this right up front because it's really important. When we're talking about mobilizing as the church, unifying together, stepping out into the spiritual work that God has for us beyond these walls throughout the week, when we're talking about that, that's not just our idea. That's really important. This wasn't just like last year, Pastor Nate was thinking about what might be cool and he thought, hey, you know what we should do this year? We should mobilize this church. That would be cool. We, it might make us look good. We'll get a good perspective. It's, it's going to help us. Let's do that this year. That's not where this came from. The reason we're doing this is out of obedience to what Jesus has asked of us. Yeah. This is not just Awaken's thing. This is Jesus's thing. Yeah. Okay? And that's important for us to start there and understand that. So I know that we're going to be stepping into this obedience, and I want us to understand where it comes from. And where we're going to start to understand this is going to be in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Um, I'll read these verses for us. It says, So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay. Pause right here. Now, the disciples, when we first started reading there, they're not sure exactly what their role is going to be. They're not sure what like, their job is yet. And they start to ask Jesus some questions about, hey, what's coming next? What's the next steps here? What are we going to do? And Jesus is like, look, listen, there's a bunch of stuff that's not your job. That's the Father's job to look over. Here's what your job is, and it's our job too. You can write this down. This is point one. Our job is to be witnesses for Jesus in our world. That's our job. That's what he's telling the disciples. That goes for us too. Now, we need to understand what a witness is then. So if we're going to be witnesses, if that's our role, then we need to have a definition for that. And a witness has two, two aspects to it. There's two parts to what it means to be a witness. Both of them apply to us, to be a witness for Jesus. The first sense is a legal sense. Okay, so we are to be testifying to the truth 
of who Jesus is. That's what that, that legal sense is. The truth of who Jesus is, what he came to do, what he has done. Okay, the second aspect or the second sense that it means to be a witness is like a spectator sense. And that means more like sharing what you've seen. So that side of things is more like what happens when Jesus is a part of your life. What you've seen him do. What, what takes place in the life of somebody who walks with Jesus. That's, that's the two sides. Both are super important. That's what it means to be a witness. And Jesus says, you are to be my witnesses. And, but he doesn't tell us that we have to do it alone. And I think that's super encouraging because it is scary to have to step out and think we're doing it by ourselves. But what he tells the disciples is, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. For them, the Holy Spirit hadn't come just yet. Jesus would leave and then the Holy Spirit would be sent. For us, the Holy Spirit has come. We have the Holy Spirit. And the same thing that Jesus told them applies to us. The Spirit is at, at work in us and through us. And what the Spirit does is he allows us to communicate clearly through multiple different ways, multiple different means, those truths. What he's done, the truth about who he is. That's the point of what the Spirit does within us. He gives us that, that opportunity to communicate clearly. The other thing the Holy Spirit does that's really important is he works in those that we're talking to. He stirs up their hearts. He's preparing them to receive his word, to receive his message, and to accept that. That's what the Spirit does. And we can trust when we step out as witnesses that he's going right there alongside us. In fact, he's already gone way ahead of us. And we're just meeting him there. So that's super encouraging for us. So we know our job. We know, okay, I, I kind of, I get that the Lord's a part of it. The Spirit's a part of it. But then Jesus tells him, hey, this is your starting point. What he tells the disciples is, you're going to begin in Jerusalem, and then you're going to go to Judea and Samaria, and then you will go to the ends of the earth. And the way that they would have heard that and what, how it would have been understood to them is, you start in your home city, and then it goes to your nation, and then it goes to foreign lands. That's the process. That's how this blooms and, and grows. Same is true for us. We know our job. We know we're walking with the Spirit, and we know that we begin in our home city, Clarksville. That's where we should be starting. That's where this all begins. Now, if you're like me, you understand that, okay, I get that basis for mobilizing. That makes sense. That's not too hard to get. But you probably still have a bunch of other questions, a bunch of other things that you're wondering about, that you're not quite sure about in this um, kind of understanding what it means to be mobilizing. You might have questions like, why? I get now what we're doing, but why? Why is that important? What's the point of all this? You might have questions like, who? Who's supposed to be doing this? Who's specifically being asked? You might have questions like, when? When am I supposed to be making time for this? When am I supposed to be stepping into all this? I don't quite see how it all fits. I think those are all valid questions. I think those are important questions. I think we should answer some of those questions. I think what we'll do is we're going to look at God's word and, and let him answer these questions for us. So that first question I want to answer is the why. This is going to be point number two. You can write this down. Why? In order to make disciples. This means introducing lost people to the one and only Savior and building them up in their faith. That's why. That's why we do this. Where we're going to see Jesus' answer to this is going to be through Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay. Jesus literally right there is saying, go, take the plunge, make disciples. He's commanding that of us. 
And a disciple is a pupil or a follower, someone who's growing and understanding as they follow someone. So Jesus is saying, hey, the people that you're making disciples, I want them to be living like me. I want them to be reflecting me. That's what a disciple is, someone who's following Jesus. And that only happens when we step up in our job as witnesses. People only are made disciples when we are actively living out that call to be witnesses for Jesus. And when we do that, and that message is accepted, that's when people change. That's when hearts are changed. And the reason why it's so important for us to understand that that's our job, to make disciples specifically, is because as we go out in the community, as we begin to mobilize to do that spiritual work, we're not saying, hey, we want you guys to do community service. That's not what we're saying. Okay? When we're talking about stepping out, we're not saying, hey, we've done our job when we've given people clothes. Hey, we did our job when we got food to people who were hungry. Hey, we, we succeeded in our role when those who were in a hard situation who were struggling and they got some help. That's not actual success. See, those are actually just the first steps of showing someone you actually care about them. But that's not where the work ends. We succeed when those who don't know Jesus meet him. Now, all that other stuff is good. We're probably going to be doing those things. We should be doing those things too, but it shouldn't just stop with that action. It's got to continue. You got to bring those two things together. That's where the spiritual work actually begins. Okay? Now, the thing about all of this is sharing the gospel, sharing the truth about Jesus, being a witness about who Jesus is, that's super important. But once someone does accept it, that's not the end of the story. Making disciples doesn't stop there. And this is a thing we forget. As the church, we frequently forget to continue what Jesus says next. Um, in verse 20, Jesus said, and teaching them to observe my commands. That's super important too. Because evangelism, that's part of this. Sharing the gospel, being a witness, absolutely part of making disciples, part of the call. But then it's got to continue into teaching them what it means to observe or follow closely what Jesus has asked of us. And the reason why I wanted to share this, why it's so important, is because all of us are going to be called the different areas. The Lord's gifted us in different ways that really pour into making disciples in different ways. Some of us really, really thrive in connecting with people who we don't know at all. Like, in instantly, we can get along with somebody. We can make connection. We can begin to conversate with them. We can talk about life. We can get to know them. And people just open up to us and share their life with us. And we're able to, to meet with them. That just, the Lord gives us to that naturally. Some of us, not so much. Some of us are kind of awkward, to be honest. We have a hard time doing that. We're a little bit shy. We're a little bit laid back. We just don't connect right away. Some of us, thrive in taking people under our wing. That's part of making disciples, bringing people under your wing, saying, hey, I see that you're following Jesus and I want to pour into you. I want to show you what it means to walk with Jesus better. I want to walk alongside you as you work through some of the struggles that you're dealing with in your life. As you encounter different obstacles and issues, I want to help you follow Jesus better. That's teaching them to observe his commands. Both sides are part of making disciples. All of us have some piece to play in there. We'll fall into that. Now, while I'm saying this, some of you guys might be thinking, yeah, that's important. Definitely important. I think that's good. I see what you're saying. We do need to be making disciples. That's good. But, man, at the end of the day, it's not really for me. That's not really for me. It's not where I'm, I, that's not my lane. I kind of stick it over in my other lane. I know, I know where I'm at. We might say things like, I serve in other ways. I, I serve here at church, you know, now and again. I'm on a team. I, I do that. So this is not really for me. I need to tell you guys, we can't make that excuse. It's not a valid argument. And we can't make that excuse 
because of what Jesus says in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. It says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This third point that I have for us today, talking about who is called to this, it's anyone who claims to be pursuing the Lord. They will be desiring to make disciples. Jesus And what we just read there, he points to the most important things that we should be doing. Starts off with, hey, you should be loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind. And then you should be loving your neighbor as yourself. And I know that when we read that, because of the structure of it, some of us heard that and we said, okay, well, I'm definitely doing number one. I'm definitely doing part one to that, the first command. I'm definitely loving the Lord my, my God with all my heart, soul, and mind. I, I serve. I read God's word regularly. I, I, I'm doing those things. I'm in an awakened group maybe. I'm pursuing the Lord. Look, you can't only do one. It's not possible. It doesn't work like that. It's a hard truth, but it doesn't work like that because of what Jesus says in verse 38. He says, after speaking that first commandment, he says, and a second is like it. And the reason that's so important to know is what he's doing there is connecting the two. Saying, hey, these go together. Even though I said first commandment, and the second is like it, it's not really a one and a two type thing. These things are melted together as one. If you're doing one, you're doing the other. It doesn't, you don't get to just do one. And that's hard for us to hear because, like I said earlier, we like to stay in our comfort zone. But we can't do that because we're not actually honoring the Lord the way that we claim and think that we are if we're not doing that second part loving our neighbor as ourself. If those two things are together, that means if we're loving the Lord with our heart, soul, and mind, then we will also be loving our neighbor as ourself. And that term, loving our neighbor as ourself, I used to think that it just meant like being kind, like the golden rule. It was like being generous. It's so much deeper than that, okay? Those are definitely aspects of it, but that's not where it ends. What it means to really love your neighbor is desiring the best that you have in every single aspect, all the way down to the spiritual level. So let's just connect the dots here. If that's the case, and if I say that my greatest treasure in my life is freedom from sin through salvation, in my relationship with the living God, that is my greatest treasure, then how can I love my neighbor and then not share that treasure? You, you can't. It's not possible. It doesn't happen. And it's God's heart. It's his will that we would step out and love our neighbor in that way. That's what he's calling us to. So if we genuinely are loving the Lord with our heart, soul, and mind, then we will also be loving our neighbor as ourself. And that's why that point is anyone who claims to be pursuing the Lord will desire to make disciples. We can't make that claim of, oh, I really, really love the Lord, but, you know, I just don't do that other part. That's not true. Now, I know as I go through that, for a lot of us, we want to step out in this. We want to make disciples. I'm I'm not saying that all of us are not wanting to do that. I know that many of us genuinely do desire to make disciples. We are in active pursuit of the Lord. We desire to follow him. We want other people to know him. We just don't know when. We're just not quite sure of how that works, when those those times are supposed to happen. And I wanted to answer that last question for us as well and kind of talk about that. Um, 
point number four, and we'll get into the scripture in just a second, but we need to know this. Point number four, the when is whatever amount of time God has given us outside of normal responsibilities. Okay. And the reason why we didn't jump into the scripture yet, because I need to clarify something, make it pretty clear for us. All right. When I say normal responsibilities, what I mean by that is work. We have our jobs. Most of us have work that takes up a lot of time. School, that's another aspect that takes up a lot of time. That's a normal responsibility we have. Managing and pouring into our family, that's a a lot of work. That's a full-time job. That takes a lot of energy, a lot of our time as well. And then even taking care of our health. Different things that we deal with medically, we need to make sure we're handling. These are all important things. Those are normal responsibilities that we have. But those things aren't exempt from God's work. And the reason why I wanted to clarify this is because when we're talking about this, a person who wholeheartedly is following Jesus is already going to be a witness in all of those areas already. Like, the Lord's already at work. You're already including him in it. You're walking alongside him. You're trying to reflect Jesus in all of those areas, at work, at school, with your family. You're trying to honor him in the way that you take care of your body. Do your best with that. Those are all things we should already be doing, all right? And the reason that I wanted to say that is because we do recognize that those things have been given to us from God. Those are gifts. Those are responsibilities that we have to steward. We should steward them well. So we want to honor God with it. But when it comes to mobilizing, when it comes to stepping out, what we are talking about is in addition to those responsibilities. What you need to know is that God has a specific moment. He has specific moments in mind that he's set apart for us to participate with outside of all of those responsibilities. Okay? So, We know this because of what's said in Ephesians 2, verse 10. Would you guys read this one with me? It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right, the emphasis here, what I want us to notice, what I'm going to kind of break down real quickly, is going to be on that created in Christ Jesus for good works, and that God prepared them beforehand. Those two things are really important. Because the original language, when you dig into it, I won't drag this out too long, but what it's trying to say there to us is that it's implying specific moments of time. We actually talked about this as we went through Ephesians last year. Um, These are specific moments or scheduled out moments that God prepared. God exists outside of time, and he works within time. So God has seen it all. He's planned our life out way beyond what we could ever imagine. And he has specific moments in our lives that we are to step out into spiritual work with him. Okay? So God prepared these moments, but we have to choose to walk in them. We have to choose that. They're not going to be forced. And my fear and what I know has happened in a lot of our lives is we look at our, our life. We say, all right, I'm including God in my work including God with my family. I'm I'm honoring him. And then when I'm not doing those things, that's me time. That's not how we should be looking at it. We should should be looking beyond all of those normal responsibilities and say, okay, Lord, what do you have for me outside of that? That's where that really, those good works, that spiritual work that God prepared beforehand, a lot of that's gonna happen outside in those windows if we will choose to step out into them if we'll choose to walk in them. Now, the problem with that is that that's going to require honesty on our end. Honesty as we look at our time, as we evaluate what we're doing in our life, what's important, those responsibilities we have, what what we're really doing. We have to look at that, be honest, and not be selfish about it. Because there's not really anybody other than the Lord who's going to be able to Hold us to that. We are the ones who have to honestly look at ourselves and stand before the Lord and say, hey, Lord, this is the time I got. I appreciate it. I'm going to use this time well. And the reason why I wanted to make this distinction between those normal responsibilities and then the time beyond that, how these things work, is because 
when we talk about mobilizing as a church, I think it's important for us to understand that I'm not asking you and Pastor Nate's not asking you to abandon your normal responsibilities and then get on board because we need to make stuff happen. That's not what we're asking. We want you guys to honor the Lord with those normal responsibilities. But then as we all together step out and use those times beyond those normal responsibilities, we're all going to fill different time slots and we will be able to meet needs. We will be able to step out in that spiritual work. And the thing about understanding that, if we're honest, we, we get, okay, I'm not going to abandon those things. I'm going to step out into those windows, those specific moments that God's given me. The thing about that is that it's kind of complicated because that time schedule that God's given, it's not the same for everybody. It's very different. That, that is not a one-size-fits-all thing. That's, there's not an answer when we ask the question of, okay, when am I supposed to do this? There's not a Hey, as long as you come to this event, you're good to go. Hey, as long as you're at this thing, then you're good. It doesn't work like that. Because for some of us, those windows are going to be, look very different. For some, it might be random, sporadic, 30-minute windows throughout the day. We're not really sure when they're going to pop up. But that's, that's that extra moments that we've got outside of normal responsibilities. For some of us, it might be multiple times a week. Maybe the Lord's blessed us. We have this extra time, a lot of flexibility. There's multiple times throughout the week that we can step out and go beyond our normal responsibilities. For some of us, maybe it's once a week. Some of us, depending on what our jobs are, what, what it is that we have to be doing, might be once a month. It's, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. We have to decide and discern between us and the Lord, all right, where is my windows at? What's the Lord asking of me? And when we do that, that could wind up looking like a whole lot of different things. Depending on those time frames, it might look like serving with a specific organization. It might look like getting out into the community, serving in one of these ministries. There's many of, that we're partnered with, and you might go serve for several hours there or serve for a full day with one of those, depending on your time. Some of us, we may not have that, that kind of scheduled time that we're able to use, but we still do have smaller windows. And for those of us who are in that camp, that might just be like when you pull into your driveway at the end of your workday and you see your neighbor across the street, not just saying, I'm too tired, I need to go inside. But like getting out of your car and walking over and saying, I'm going to take this few minutes I got here and I'm going to interact with them. I'm going to begin to plant seeds of who Jesus is, what Jesus does. It doesn't mean that you necessarily the first time say, hey, let me tell you the gospel immediately right now. Maybe it does lead to that. I don't know. Like I said, the Lord, the Spirit will be at work in those situations. But at the least, we should be building those relationships up to where we will be able to be a witness for Jesus in a deeper sense at some point. Could be making cookies and bringing them to somebody who you don't know. There's so many different things that this could look like. This could be inviting a coworker who you talk to at work about the Lord, but then you never engage with them outside of work ever. Invite them to your house for dinner. Use that time. Take them to coffee. Talk to them. Get to know them on a better level. Maybe that's the time allotments that you got. All of us have somewhere to fall in that. All right? It's not going to be, hey, I can tell you right now, hey, this is what you need to do. We have to discern that between us and the Lord. So each of us has a role to play. I can't tell you exactly what it is, what it's going to look like. But I wanted you guys to know that you're not having to figure this out alone. As a church, we haven't done this real well. So what you're, as you look around, you're not looking necessarily at just a bunch of experts who just have it all together, who have been doing this for years. Probably not. A lot of us haven't been. And that's why we, we like I said in the beginning, we want to step out into obedience. This is part of maturity as a church. So you're not doing this alone. You're not figuring out all by yourself. There's other people who are walking alongside you in the same exact spot, who are working through the same questions. And we want this to be as easy as possible to get you guys off that cliff, to take the plunge, to begin to get that initial shock over with and get acclimated to where you can continually jump over and over and over again. We want to make that as easy as possible. So we're not going to be keeping this hidden from you. We're going to have 
um, different ministries and organizations. We will talk about them at the beginning of services. We'll have them posted on the screens. But that's not where it's going to stop. We're going to bring the, some of the leaders of these ministries, and we're going to have them right outside in the lobby, standing at that, that white Connect cart over there where you can talk with them. You can actually meet them face to face, shake their hand. You can say, hey, what's this actually going to look like for me to get involved? What are the different things that I might be able to do with what, the time that I have? We're going to connect you with those people, and they're going to be right in front of you. And we're going to do that because we want it to be easy and also because I understand that we can't leave excuses on the table of why we're not getting engaged. And that's important. So throughout this year, there'll be different people from different ministries that we'll have out there. And that's going to start right now. We've been doing it the last couple of weeks, but today we're going to have Josh Brimmer. Josh is going to be out at the, the cart. And Josh um, serves very faithfully. He's a, an excellent leader. He's one of the greatest leaders I know, honestly, when it comes to stepping out in outreach. He's a fantastic example. And Josh serves with R for One. If you don't know what R for One is, um, R for One serves the homeless. R for One serves those who are overlooked in our society and those who are less fortunate than us. And Josh can talk to you, Pastor Jeremiah as well. He's here. He'll be roaming around. He might be at the cart as well. But you can talk to both of them and say, hey, I would like to get involved. What, what would that look like? What's available? What could I do? Josh is also leading our, what we call right here at Awaken, Community Connection. And this is very vast. This is just launching. But community connection, what we mean by that is serving in all different random kind of miscellaneous ways. This could be getting groceries for people. This could be talking to an elderly person who maybe can't leave their house. They're stuck where they are and they don't get to meet anybody and just having conversations with them. This could be Maybe maintenance work that might be needed. This could be leading Bible studies potentially in the community, doing that other aspect of discipleship we talked about, building people up. So many opportunities. But Josh is going to be out there, and he's waiting for people to step out and take the plunge and say, hey, I will do this. This is the time I got. And we're doing that not to force you into it again, but to make it as easy as possible for us to get into this, into the rhythm. And then we're also going to have uh, Vanessa Jakubiak. So Vanessa, another fantastic leader in our church, um, she's going to be out at the cart as well. Um, she serves um, at Hope Pregnancy um, on and off, and um, she knows what it looks like to be there, um, some of the opportunities there, and she'll be able to connect you if you're interested in that. Um, she'll be able to talk to you, hey, this is the channels you need to go through. This is the direction that you need to go if you want to get involved. This is some of the things that they do, that this is what it would look like if you serve there. She'll be able to answer some of those questions. Now, those aren't the only ministries, but that's just where we're going to start. And as we go through the year, we'll have more and more people out there that you guys will be able to connect with. But they'll be out there today. So I wanted to encourage you with that. And the last thing, right before we close, I want to ask you guys, is are you ready? Are you ready to do it? Take a breath, kind of get yourself ready. We're on the edge. We're looking over this cliff right now. But are you ready to take the plunge? So like I said, the Lord's been nudging us. He's probably nudging our hearts right now to go ahead and take the plunge. It's time. It's time to do that. I want to let you guys know that if we do that, for those of us who answer that, who are obedient to it, the Lord is going to honor that there's going to be some really, really cool things that our God's going to begin to do in this city.